Welcome to ABC. I'm your host, Veronica Steele. Ask the Teacher is a Q&A platform where you can ask questions about your child's early childhood development or the CDA process. Let's go to class. Preschool edition discussion today. So let's check out our agenda, shall we? We're talking about preparing for the CDA verification visit. We're giving introductions. I'm Ms. Veronica Steele, who's joining me today. Oh, nice to meet you. And nice to meet you too. Thanks for joining today. This is a 40 minute Q&A. After each slide, we will have questions and comments. Remember your netiquette practices. And remember, these, all mics are muted and cameras are prohibited and other social media platforms. Well, let's go to class. All right, so let's talk about the setting for the CDA verification visit. So today's setting that we're talking about is preschool. Let's talk about what happens when your PDS candidate is contacted. You need to fill out a pre-verification checklist for your specialist. That's saying this form here, your name, your number, um, your program name, your program address so they can find you, um, your director's name. Your director needs to be aware that your PDS verification visit is happening this day. And you need to make sure there are no center-wide events this day. All right. The required things that you need to have on hand, your PDS specialist, when they meet you and say hello, they will be asking for your identification. Make sure that your competency standards book is there and your scoring tool, tool is in the back of that book. All right. Make sure your professional portfolio is there. You can show your CPR and first aid, which needs to identify infants, toddlers, if it's infants, toddlers, CPR, or children, adults, infant, toddler, AED certified, and it has to be current. Make sure that your 120 hours are in your portfolio and your documentation of such. All right, now remember your verification visit will take it four hours. Two minutes of observation, yes one minute of portfolio, one minute of review with you. And remember, if you don't have any, if you have questions for your PDS specialist, please feel free to ask. That's why your specialist is there. Your specialist is there to assist you. Remember, they're on your side. They're there to verify your documentation for the council. Yes. So please make sure that you have all those corresponding things in your professional development portfolio. All right, are there questions? No? All right, we'll move right along. So let, oh, you have a question. Okay, let's see. Oh, the question, it says, what happens if three students are scheduled and only two show up? Hmm. Well, your verification visit will continue. Your PDS specialist, when they enter your scores, they will put a note in the CSI tool that you had two students that were present, but three were um, scheduled. So you may want to go ahead and lean towards the five students that day. I'm pretty sure your director who's rooting for you <laughs> more than ever will probably be available and make sure that the scheduling conflict is not there. So these things happen. So try to have at least five students present just in case. All right, let's move on. Let's see, it says, have my CDA professional portfolio checklist completed? So yes, you need to complete your portfolio checklist. Please have this sign so that your PDS specialist can see that you've added this at the beginning of your portfolio and all the components in your portfolio are corrected and complete. Also, make sure that your CDA education completion is also signed and dated. 
it says that you have 10 training hours and plan in a safe, healthy learning environment. You have 10 hours of advancing children's physical and intellectual development. You have 10 hours of social intellectual development, 10 hours building productive relationship, 10 hours managing effective program all the way down that your six competency statements are complete listing all of these eight components. <laughs> yes, please have it signed and dated. All right, check. We're getting ready for our verification visit. Any questions? Is there eight competency standards or six? So you, let's go back. So there are eight subject areas, but there are only six competency standard statements, okay? So if you turn into your book, you'll see your six competency standards. So the first one is to establish a safe, healthy learning environment. The second one is to advance physical and intellectual competence. The third one is to support social emotional development and to provide positive guidance. The fourth one is to establish a positive and productive relationship with families. The fifth one is to ensure a well-run purposeful program that is responsive to participant needs. And your last competency statement should be titled to maintain a commitment of professionalism. So I actually workbook, it work walks you through your CDA journey, okay? So that you will have success. So let's just take a look at the book for a little bit. So these are your prerequisites before you are to apply for your CDA. It's broken up with your experience, all of the requirements, and then it tracks it for you. So the CDA, how will you receive your training? So you can vlog and blog your process so that you can stay organized in tracking your accomplishments and your plan. What type of education will be used? Will you be using formal or you, will you be hiring an organization? There's different product projects to complete in here. Which plan will you choose? And then it navigates your actual CDA competency statements. So the first competency statements, it lists the six right here. The first competency statement is to promote a safe, healthy learning environment. It lists the function areas that you should write in your paper and how will I promote? So you always wanna start your competency statements with the word I. So this is just a little helpful um, workbook that I put together to help the candidates. All right, so I hope that helped you out a little bit on how to compile your competency statements. All right, any questions? Not at this time. Oh, wait, we have a question. Why is it important to state I statements when writing your competency statements? This is imperative. You want to reflect how you as the lead teacher in the classroom will establish a safe, healthy learning environment. A lot of candidates tend to write my center or they'll say, all follow your program guidance, the basic rules like lock the door or playground to teachers watching students at all times if there are more than 10, if the ages are three to five, yes. If there's 16 and there's two teachers, yes. All of that's probably across the board. However, how will you, they want to know what you're going to do. So you'll start your statement with, I will establish a safe, healthy learning environment and then you're going to break up safe, healthy learning. So it will look like I, to provide a safe learning environment, I will make sure that I am in ratio. You see how the dialect changes from what everyone will do to what you will do. Or 
ask for ID from the parents when they're picking up children. Yes. Mm -hmm. I will model conflict resolution. Do you see how it's more personal? And remember, this is how you will protect children in a safe, healthy learning environment. Okay. All right, let's go to the next question. Oh, training documentation. This is a big one. So please make sure that your training documentation is accurate. If you are getting your training from an organization and they provide certificates, have their certificates in there with the correct amount of hours. Member, you need 10 learning hours in each of the eight competency areas. Yes. And if it's going to be from a training organization with a letterhead letter, make sure that they include the date you had your training, the core hours and the subject areas. Mm -hmm. And you wanna make sure that the address is on there and not electronic signature, but a handwritten signature should be on this letter, certified letter, official letterhead, yes. All right. All right, no, training logs are not accepted. All right, so we're getting ready. Do we have any questions about that? We do, okay, let's take a look. They want to know why individual consultants aren't considered official training. Well, basically, um, not everyone is qualified to teach CDA classes. There are guidelines and standards that the CDA council prefers. Like PDS specialists, they have to have a certain level of education, a certain level of experience. So just an individual consultant, they might not have the necessary resources or the necessary experience or guidance to be able to direct you in best practices for early childhood. This is why. So just get a training organization. Um, you can hire ABC Tutor LLC. They have an extensive background of education and degree instructors who can guide you through the early childhood process. So it's a mentorship program where they guide you towards 80 of your CDA hours. If you do need 120, you just let your specialist know at that time and they can help you with locating those resources as well. This is a, the most compensatory friendly program that I know of. Currently, the price is $150 to get started. Yep. All right, so let's go to the next question. All right, so family questionnaire summary sheet. This is something you should have in your portfolio that you should have collected from your families. Do we have any questions about that? No? <laughs> we do have one question, yes. Do the PDS specialists score you according to what paper? parents said or guardians said regarding your practices. Oh no, this is confidential. Your PDS specialist is just there to count them. They will not be reading these. If you see them reading them, you can actually say like, excuse me, um, I was told that the PDS specialist was only here to count to make sure that I receive more than half back. If you have 10 students in your program, you should at least have half back or try to get more than half back, okay? Yes, all right, let's move on. So a safe, healthy learning environment. So let's talk about what safe looks like. We kind of talked a little bit about check safe, you, that you are in ratio. All of those things are important. And you do want to check out the grounds before you go outside. You Maybe you can have... Um, in the morning when you're coming to work to check the grounds to make sure these are public schools. They, you might have some type of paraphernalia on the playground, uh, some type of smoking device. So you want to make sure that you check your playground before um, you allow your students to play there. You wanna make sure that you bring your emergency cards, your first aid kit, your sign in sign out sheets, just in case a parent comes to pick the child up. If it's cold, of course, make sure that the children are 
dressed appropriately. Some centers have a degree policy and Lysing has a degrees policy. See what it is for your state. Most of them are 25 degrees or above. <laughs> but if you're in a hot area, you might want to check to see what the temperature is for those as well. All right, because you just want to be mindful of those things. Those things are very, very important. Um, you want to make sure that the materials are safe. There are no cracks in your materials, that there are no pokey things that can poke and hurt the children. You want to make sure the, the equipment is kept in the best shape. All right. All right. So let's, oh, don't forget your first aid sign. Make sure that this sign is located on your first aid area. So if anyone wants to come into your center as a volunteer, as a parent, an emergency happened, they can look around and know where your supplies are. Especially if you have a substitute teacher who doesn't have enough time to survey the whole classroom before they're able to hop right into action with the boys and girls. So this area should be labeled. Your emergency procedure should be labeled next to each Door. If you're in a daycare, they should be by your exit windows and doors. Okay. Also with the safety um, in organization, just to throw this out there, if you do have allergies for your um, learners, you want to make sure they are posted in the feeding or eating area. If it is um, in your classroom, if it's in the lunchroom, cafeteria, those should be posted for your food service worker. They should also be posted by your sinks and wherever you handle food, this should be evident for the teachers to see. It should not be displayed with the children's names. That should be covered with a piece of paper. Yes, it's just to protect their privacy. This is best policy and practices for your program. So let's see healthy. What does healthy learning environment looks like? Healthy learning environment looks like <laughs> FDA. <laughs> it looks like foods that have been shown healthy for children. Yes, you wanna make sure you follow your pyramid, your healthy yummy yummy pyramid, the green vegetables, <laughs> lots of vegetables and things, just a balanced diet. If your center, um is a place where, like a daycare, where parents bring meals in, you want to make sure that you just promote healthy eating, post that pyramid and give little handouts to remind them, especially if a child's lunch isn't in the best healthy um, practices, just hand that little flyer out to that parent just to remind them about the rainbow. Let's eat the rainbow. <laughs> Not so many sweets and snacks, because you know, those things make the children's mood fluctuate as well. And we want them to be at their best so they can learn and retain all the information, excuse me. <laughs> all right, let's see. Uh, healthy means disinfecting, yes. Um, especially now, we wanna make sure that we're wiping, sanitizing those toys, we're wiping those tables. We're reminding boys and girls to wash their hands after toileting, after eating. We are washing our hands. We're sitting with them. We're modeling safe practices by modeling how to eat safely. We're not up walking around and eating and allowing our students to do that. Someone should be seated at the table with a child when they're eating meals. Yes. <laughs> All right. Oh, and speaking of eating meals, if you are a program that provides free meals, you should have this sign posted in Justice for All. All right, let's go to the learning environment. Your learning environment. So we talked about how it should be safe. We talked about how it should be healthy. Now let's talk about the learning environment as a whole. So let's see, your learning environment should be appropriate, developmentally appropriate. That means you should know what it looks like to have children three to five years old in your program and what developmentally appropriate looks like. That's where all your training comes in. So you want to make sure that things are labeled at their label are are labeled on their level. You don't want high things up where they can't reach them. You want your pictures on their on their level. 
Okay, so and you want to separate your learning environments, you should have dramatic play and it should say dramatic play. If you have boys and girls in your um, classroom who are diverse, you want to be respectful and culturally competent to represent that um, learning area for them and label it with their um, native language. You want to have your science technology. You want to have your social studies. You want to have your building um, block area. You want to have your um, toys and games area. You want to have your library, your bibliotheque uh, labeled. You want to have your sand table and water table labeled. You want to have your excuse me, our area labeled, your easels should be labeled and they should be sectioned. Your classroom should not be run all together, but it should be easy for the boys and girls to decide where they'd like to work. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, your materials need to be developmentally appropriate. If you have three and five-year-olds in the classroom, you should not have ditto sheets, worksheets, things like that. This is not developmentally appropriate for their age. You want to make sure that you have a variety of materials. So not all you want to fix cubes, but you want to have some zippers, some buttons, things like that. You want to have your trucks. So if you have the four um, wheel trucks, the large trucks, that's great. You want to make sure you have more than one <laughs> to make it appropriate for all learners and keeping down conflicts. And you want to also have miniature cars. So not teeny tiny, but like matchbox cars. You want to have those cars and you want to have ramps and things that boys and girls can use their minds and be creative to scaffold their learning. Um, you want to have authentic materials in your learning environment, not only um, colorful, but you want to make sure there are some items in your dramatic play area that they can see at home. So if they have cups, make sure that there are authentic cups. I recommend that you do put some ceramic um, things into your classroom. I know, I know, they get broken, I know, but your center, and there's um, donors, cho donors, donors choose, excuse me, where you can get tons and tons of resources uh, for your center. You can ask your early childhood specialist that you may be lacking in some authentic materials, and they're more than anxious to help your classroom be successful, because we want to make sure that is functional, developmentally appropriate with authentic learning experiences so that your children can grow and learn. Yep, you want to definitely teach with fidelity in this area. Uh, you want to make sure that you have a schedule. Your schedule, again, should not be in the air for teachers only, even if you have infant toddlers, but your schedule should be on the wall, picturesque, <laughs> so that the boys and girls can maybe see themselves doing the things that would make your schedule really developmentally appropriate and authentic and meaning for, for children. Children need meaning so that it makes sense for them. So if there's a picture of them washing their hands, you can actually take a picture of that student. Make sure you have permission <laughs> from the parent and you can actually put that in the area. So when it's time to wash our hands or it's toileting time, they can actually see, oh, Josh is washing his hands. And up, oh, it's arrival time. And they see people taking off their boys and girls, taking off their coats. Up, oh, it's leaving time. And you have a picture with a person or with one of one of the little with one of the children and their parent waving goodbye. At the end of the day, if it's choice time, you have choices with children making choices. If it's read aloud time, either you have a picture with you or they're a co-teacher in the environment and they're reading a book so that the children can see the different steps. Remember, children aren't just learning auditorily, they're learning visually and kinesthetically as well. So you want to make sure that they can go up to it and read it because yes, that's reading, that's beginning reading schools. Touching left to right is beginning reading skills. So they're reading the pictures, the same thing they do when they're reading books and words. <laughs> All right. Oh, yes. Remember, there are three teachers in the room. There is T1, the lead teacher, T2, the associate teacher, T3, your learning environment. So you're using all three so that you and your co-teacher are not running around, stomping out fires and getting all the children to 
be safe, be responsible, and be respectful, but you can use your learning environment as a reminder, and your schedule does that. If you have that child that's crying and needs to be comforted, you can actually redirect them without walking over to them. You can send a little reminder. There's maybe a song, like more time to learn, then time to play, so so that they know what that means. You can say maybe, oh, I can see that you have water coming from your eyes. You seemed a little upset. Would you like to go and read the schedule so you'll know what's going on? And then they're able to self-soothe and go do that. Or you can say, remember the schedule's on the wall. If you need help, you can ask your teacher. You can ask me. So little things without rushing over to them. Remember, you want to promote self-autonomy. You want them to have intrinsic motivation to want to self-soothe without, all, without always having to run to them. Of course, we always are always there for them. But give those little hints first to see if that's not working. Of course, you need to get over there or your T2 t teacher, your associate teacher needs to go and address that child's but give them a little time. So if they're crying when they first come in and it's a routine thing that they do, make sure that you're smiling. Hi, good morning, Josh. It's so nice to see you. What did we do first today? Just give them those reminders and you'll be surprised. Or make sure that you have your calm down area in your learning, envi in your learning environment so they know where to go if they're upset. Some to your children don't always want you rushing over there comforting them. They want their mom. So you don't want to go too fast. If you go too fast, you may make it worse. So give that child time. They'll call you with how their um, demeanor is. They'll call you if it's like an emergency and you need to get over there right away. You'll learn your students. You'll know your students. You'll know what they need. Well, all right, so it looks like we're getting closer and closer to being ready for our verification visit. We just learned what it looks like to have a self healthy learning, a safe, healthy learning environment. Are there any questions? Let's take a look. There is a question here. This question says, oh, conflict resolution. Oh, it's a conflict resolution question. It reads, what? I was always told to go to the child when they are screaming and hollering, <laughs> kneel at their level and address the concern. This isn't right? Oh, definitely. Definitely promote conflict resolution. You want to know your child. If your child, um, your student usually comes in and they're upset, there should be a routine for that child, that they know what's expected of them. Make sure that your rules are posted, that you've done with your students at the beginning of the year. Be safe, be responsible, be respectful. That covers all the things that can happen in a classroom. If this child is a child that you know needs to be soothed by a teacher, then of course you would go right away. If it's a child that usually just is crying for attention, or if this is a child that usually hits, you'll know you need to go right away, or usually bites, you'll know you need to go right away. But if this is a child who just needs to take some belly breaths and they can do that on their own, give them that chance. Yes, you're there to model. Yes, you're there to support. Yes, we love social emotional, but social emotional is also guiding them toward self-modulation or emotional modulation and not always running to them is a good idea. You need to learn, know your child, know your student, and then you'll know what they need. Some students may even need a, a chart of red and green choices. We'll talk about that in a later video. Um, any more questions? Let's see. In response to providing a healthy learning environment, what if the parent refuses to provide healthy snacks? We've all been there. <laughs> we've all had that parent or we've seen that child that has lots of sweets in their lunchbox. You may want to do a lesson this time. You may want, if it's, you know, it's happening 
more on occasion. If you put out those little hints to the parent, you send out those newsletters, you pull that parent to the side, maybe talk to them about it, and you still get that resistance, you may want to do a lesson, a lesson on safe, healthy learning. You may want to do a lesson on healthy eating. You can do like a fruit salad. You can have a whole rainbow of um, things that you bring in. You can bring in fruits and vegetables to the children in the area may not have seen because they don't grow in the state that you live in. You might want to try star fruit or dragon fruit or kumquats or squash. I don't know. You might want to try a fruit or vegetable like that and maybe ask a parent, um, can you, when you go to the grocery store, can you have your child take a picture of a fruit or vegetable that they like to try and then just promote it? And then you'll be surprised. And if you model that healthy eating in front of that child and you talk about being safe, responsible, and respectful, and safety means to take care of your body, healthy means to make healthy choices, mm -hmm, being responsible is doing what you're supposed to do even though no one's looking, which means eat your fruit and vegetables, that child will come around and that parent will too. Remember, we want to promote that. And you may want to have a center event where parents can come into the center. We love volunteers, right? Yeah, you can have it where they come into the center and you all model healthy eating. You might want to um, have that, there's a Reggie Rainbow might come visit your center the kidney foundation there are tons of ways to get parents to jump on board but they also have to believe in your mission and your statement and align for the whole program to make success and sometimes it may just be a language barrier or a cultural barrier so you want to be culturally competent to that family and see maybe what they eat at home. You can also have a family bring in a box or something that they eat for your dramatic play area. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This also helps parents say, hey, they're not judging me what I bring my child to eat. They're just trying to help me. You know, it kind of puts them at ease a little bit when they don't feel attacked. Well, all right, thank you so much for joining me today. Do you have any more questions or comments? Not at this time. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. I enjoy learning with you. I'll see you next time. We'll be talking about competency statement number two to advance physical and intellectual competence. What do you do? Bye-bye now.